I do want to say again how thankful I am to be here. I'm thankful to be able to go out and preach the gospel places, but I'm particularly thankful to be able to do it here with the Bellevue Church of Christ. I'm thankful for you and your stand, your diligence, and all the prayers that you've offered, and your love of God and His Word. I don't know if I can say enough about that. On a personal level, I'm thankful for Michael, and he tells the story one way, I'm going to tell it the other way, is that he actually did have good answers a lot of the time. And so, you know, he tells it one way, I tell it another way. That's his humility kicking in. Lessons from the life of Abraham. Anybody who's read the Bible has to be impressed with Abraham. Not just impressed with him in character, but impressed on how essential his story is to the Bible story. We're introduced to Abraham before chapter 12, but we're introduced to him in his character starting in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we have what's commonly referred to as the call of Abraham. It's monumental in understanding the Bible. In verse 1 of chapter 12 of Genesis, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I think there are a few things to notice about this. I'm always fascinated, one, by the fact that he didn't really know where he was going. I think about it if somebody pulled up and said, get in the car. I said, where are we going? See so when you get there. I'm probably not going to get in the car. Even if it's my friend, I'm still likely not to get in the car. But Abraham did just that, and that's because he knew who was making this command. But when you look here in Genesis chapter 12, you see that this is Abraham being called, that he heard the word of God, he believed the word of God, and he obeyed the word of God. Now, breaking that down is something that we do to sort of get elements and to see what it is we're looking at, but it happened in those stages. And I guess you could say that Abraham was given a three-step plan of salvation. Counting the steps doesn't make it any less true. This is what happened. And subsequent to this, we're told that Abraham was justified. And there's a lot of intervening things that happen along the storyline of Abraham, but we get over to chapter 17, and we have a little bit more information given. At this point, they're in the land, the land that God was going to get him that he would never fully receive in his own lifetime. But in chapter 17 and verse 1, we learn that Abram was 90 years old and 9. He's 99. And after previously giving promise about him being a father of nations, having a multitude and of seed and, and all the things that go along with that, here he is 99 and God is going to reaffirm the promise. And you see there, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, be thou perfect, and I'll make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, if you're looking at his age, and you're thinking about what Abraham may have been thinking about, you kind of think, well, just get on with it already, or are you still going to talk about this? And so in the New Testament, several times we have references to these facts of how it took faith for Abraham to believe these promises. But in verse 5, he says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And then in verse 6, I will make thee exceeding fruitful and make na nations of thee, and the king shall come out of, and kings shall come out of thee. And then in verse 15, God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife... Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And then in verse 16 and 17, there are the specifics. I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. It's not going to be Ishmael. It's not going to be somebody else for the promise. Sarah is going to bear a son to Abraham, and that will be the child of promise. And that's how it's going to be. Now, you and I know the rest of the story. Isaac was born. 
And certainly Abraham was very thankful to God for receiving Isaac as the fulfillment of this promise. But you get into Genesis chapter 22. And when you look at Genesis chapter 22, you start to understand not just the fact that Abraham had faith. We learned that all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. He's got faith. He already proved that. But you're going to learn about the quality of his faith. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks about how it is that the nation of Israel was the physical seed of Abraham. And physically, they had an inheritance based on Abraham. But in Romans chapter 4, he continues on in verse 16 and talks about how it is that Abraham is the father of us all after talking about the faith of Abraham. In that sense, we are Abraham's seed. And so we talk about him being the father of the faithful, or if you want to say it this way, the father of faith in that sense, you can look at Genesis chapter 22 to understand what that means. Now in Genesis chapter 22, it becomes important that you realize what we just reviewed about the promise to Abraham, about the son and being a father of nations. And you understand the amount of time that passed between receiving the promise and receiving the fulfillment of the promise. 99 years old, and this is reaffirmed, he's 100 years old when Isaac is born. And that makes you think about what it is that he was seeing and what he went through. But in Genesis chapter 22, you find that God once again called Abraham. And this time it was a little bit different. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now, I know a lot of people have zoned in on that, and their curiosity has been stirred up a little bit, partly by maybe having read James chapter 1 and verse 13. And in the book of James, James says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And, of course, you know, there are those people out there that are just really excited about finding something in the Bible that doesn't fit. Ah, uh, ah, uh, God tempted it's used in two different senses. It's not that difficult. It doesn't take a great Bible student to understand that. You have to compare the information. James 1 tells us that he doesn't tempt, and in that sense, he's not soliciting us to do evil. He's not trying to get us to go astray. That's not his purpose. And the sense that it's being used in Genesis chapter 22 is in the sense of a trial. Certainly, there are many trials of faith in the Bible. God has done a lot of things in his dealings with man to try to, in an experienced way, ask, are you really serious? Do you love the truth? Do you want the truth? And in this sense, God did tempt Abraham. We're going to be tempted. We're going to be tried. Sometimes we are, by others, going to be solicited to sin. The important thing about this is that at the end of it all, Abraham was still a faithful man, which is the most important part. When you look in your New Testament, you find in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower, and you're familiar with the different kinds of soils. And in particular, you find the stony ground, the rocky ground that bore no fruit, that it had no root in itself. And you find that when tribulation and persecution arose because of the world, he's offended. And the point of this is that any little struggle whether it's a trial by God or perhaps a notion that sin is out there and I might want to go off after it, anything is going to take this person away because he didn't have a root in himself. Abraham had roots. He was a different kind of person. He was the blessed man that you read about in Psalm 1. Like the tree planted by waters, it's going to be strong. And it's not going to be blown about by everything that comes along. When you read in Romans chapter 4, you find that the blessed man is the one to whom the Lord doesn't impute sin. And you think about the, the parallels there between Psalm 1 and Romans 4, and you think about the life of Abraham, and it comes together that God is creating a picture for us of what exactly it means to be faithful. What does it mean to be faithful? Abraham heard God's word, he believed God's word, and he obeyed God's word. That's what it means to be faithful. And a temptation, a trial, is important for illustrating that to us, ourselves, before God Almighty, 
and so that the world can see our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, we're taught to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The, the thing that strikes me about that passage is, why are they asking? You don't see somebody just looking at the ground, minding in their own business, and walk up to the person and say, boy, your hope is just really out there. What, what, where do you get that hope? It's the trials of this life that give us the opportunity to present that hope to this world. Whether it's turning away from sin or in times of trial similar to what Abraham endured. So we read about the temptation of Abraham and we understand how it is that his faith was tested. But I want us to look at the reaction of Abraham next. When God called out to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1, Abraham responded and he said, Behold, here I am. Here I am. You know, there are three times in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham responds this way. The second time in verse 7, when Isaac asks him a question, he says, here I am. The third again, when he's about to slay Isaac and God calls out to him in verse 11, and he says, here am I. But this isn't the only time that a similar statement is said in the Bible. And the thing that I want us to see about this is that Abraham's response is the demonstration of a clear conscience. That's what kind of man he was. Now, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, you've got that beautiful and awesome scene of the throne room of God surrounded by the angels there. And they're crying out about his holiness. And Isaiah becomes aware of his sins. Woe unto me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Right there in the presence of God, he's sanctified with the coal from the altar. Now, subsequent to that, God presents this in verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Having just been cleansed, you remember how you felt when you came up out of the waters of baptism? You can identify with what Isaiah was experiencing there. You can relate to that. But after this taking place, Isaiah responds, Then said I, Here am I, send me. This is the response of a cleared conscience. That's what he has. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4, whether Moses was thinking about his own conscience being clear or not, the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see. You're familiar with what happened here. Moses had seen the burning bush. and He was curious about those things. And God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. Moses didn't run away. Moses wasn't afraid about this. Moses wanted to know more. Moses was pushing forward with the faith he had. Now his faith is going to grow because that's how faith works. If it's faith at all, it's going to grow. And so Moses responded likewise. Then also in 1 Samuel chapter 3, you've got the young boy Samuel and how it is that God calls out to him. And you can read the first four verses. But particularly in verse 4, the Lord called and he said, here am I. And after a brief exchange with Eli, he finally responded, said, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. That's a good attitude. But Samuel wasn't necessarily afraid of these things the way a lot of people are at the call of God. Now, by way of contrast, you have to be thinking about what happened in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, after Adam and Eve had sinned, God called unto Adam. He called to Abraham, he called to others. Before all that happened, he called to Adam. And said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Abraham responded to God. Adam tried to hide himself from God. A lot of people do that today. They do that by trying to excuse themselves from the worship services of the church. They do similarly when they try to avoid the brethren or when they put their Bible in a drawer because they know what it says. They're trying to hide from God. It's interesting to think about some of the problems that Israelites had later on in biblical history of how it was that their thinking about God was flawed. You know, if you're sinning and you put the Bible in the drawer, God still knows you're sinning. 
If you don't go to church and you sit at home feeling bad about not going to church, God still knows that you're sinning. But a lot of people had an idea later on that somehow God is the God of Judea. You get outside that and you're free and clear. This is kind of like the three river rule, you know. You cross the first river, you know, you're saying only cross the second river, whatever. You, you, you see how it works. By the time you get to the third river, you're not a Christian and nobody knows you. Do whatever you want to. And a lot of people have this idea about God today, but a lot of people had it even during the time of the Israelites. You think about Jonah in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 3. When Jonah receives a call, Jonah, you go preach to Nineveh. That's the capital of Assyria enemy of Israel at the time. Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. How's that going to work out? We're going to talk about Jonah later this week. But when I think about that, I think about what we find in Psalm 139. And for time's sake, I'll spare it. But basically, it's asking the question, where are you going to go to get away from God? How are you going to accomplish that? It's not possible. Abraham understood some things about God that later people did not. He understood some things about God that people today do not. And this corresponded to the kind of faith that Abraham had. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, we're told that perfect love casts out fear. He was not afraid when God called him in the sense that a lot of people are afraid. Just last week, it was a particularly difficult week, and a storm came in. I have never heard thunder like this storm shook the house, sucked the air out of the room. The kids come downstairs. Dad, you hear that? Of course I heard that. <laughs> How are you not going to hear that? What was on my mind is, boy, I hope this is it, because then I wouldn't have to go to work today. <laughs> I would have cleared my schedule. It's a different way of looking at things, isn't it? Abraham understood certain things. What was it that God was going to ask him? Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. A familiar theme. He's going to receive part of the information. We'll come back and talk about that in a second. My oldest daughter, Lorelai, always cringes when this passage comes up in a sermon. She talks about how God's just rubbing it in here. You know, your only son, the one you love. And he is, isn't he? He's saying, Abraham, what are you made of? Let's talk about that. I heard one person describe it like twisting the knife. And that's the way it feels when you read it. This was a requirement of love. That's the first thing. The requirement of Abraham was a requirement of love. This is the boy he loved. This was the son of promise upon whom his hopes were, were pinned. What's going to come of his legacy after this? But I look at this and I do think about it in a different way also. If God hadn't said that Abraham loved Isaac, it probably would have been easy for later Bible readers to just say, well, he was just a cold man. It's no big deal to him. But God's commentary on the heart of Abraham is that Abraham is the kind of father who loved that son. Now, we know previously that Abraham was this kind of man and this kind of father. If you remember right, in Genesis chapter 21, verses 10 and 11, when Abraham was commanded to send out Ishmael and Hagar, it grieved him. He cared about them because he was a compassionate and caring individual. And so this was no simple task for him. The text says it was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Because of his son. So this was a requirement of love. And anything that people in this world have gone through in separating themselves from things they love for righteousness sake can be compared to Abraham. Abraham experienced those things more than probably most people. He understood those things. But let me ask the question. Are you willing to sacrifice what you love? If what you love in this life gets in between you and service to God, are you willing to sacrifice that? I'm not going to stand up here and pretend that that's an easy question to answer. 
But it's a legitimate question reading the Bible and asking, what does it mean to have faith? Why is Genesis chapter 22 in the Bible when Abraham is featured so prominently as a person of faith, if not to teach us this very point? That your faith demands everything. We, We use passages like Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then we read passages like this and we think, well, you know, God's not going to ask that of me. I think it's dangerous to think that because just as soon as you think it, trouble might be coming. When you think about what it is that God expects of us, we ought to be thankful that he asks for so little. But sometimes we're going to have to give up things we love and sometimes it might be the thing that we love the most to determine what we really do love the most, right? In Matthew chapter 19, verses 20 through 22, you read about the rich young ruler. The young man had said to Jesus about the commandments, all these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Just as a side note, I think it's interesting there that when you find Jesus rehearsing the commandments to this man, he leaves out the first and second commandment concerning idolatry. What is this guy going to do? Call him out on it? This man is an idolater. His idol was money. You see that going on here. If thou be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard the saying, he went away very sorrowful for he had great possessions. We know what he loved the most. And we know that he loved those great possessions more than he loved the Lord, more than he cared about his own soul. And that was a mistake. The second thing that we find when we look at Abraham and this requirement is that this was a requirement of labor. Get thee unto the land of Moriah, and then he's going to have to climb a mountain. You think about the labor that's involved in this project. They're going to have to take a trip. They didn't get in an air-conditioned automobile and drive on a freeway, you know, stopping at popular roadside attractions. Animals across difficult terrain carrying a load with them. This was a requirement of labor. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 7, the apostle Paul says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. I think a lot of times people think about that passage with all of their misunderstandings of what faith is, or walking by faith and not by sight, what that is, and they completely overlook the fact that there's a walk involved. That is work. Maybe not as much work as other things, but the concept is there, is that there is an action involved in it, that there's a doing involved in what he says there. But the passage doesn't stop there. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor. Because we're willing to be absent and present with the Lord, we're laboring. We want this, and therefore we are willing to work. There's that four-letter word. I don't know what people think about when that shows up in the Bible. Like God just wants to sit around and don't twiddle your thumbs. That would be work. I understand what the Bible teaches about grace and faith and works. It's not particularly difficult to understand what the Bible teaches about these things if you want to understand them. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. In other words, this labor has something to do with acceptance. There's a connection there, lo and behold. But it's right there in the Bible for everybody to see. And then he talks about the judgment and how there will be an accounting given for things done, the things you do in the body. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11, this is a passage that's captured my interest over the past year, the entire doctrine of what the Sabbath rest was and how it is that the Hebrews writer uses that, explaining to the Jews that their rest was not the ownership of the real estate of the land, nor was it the time off that they take on Saturdays. That that wasn't it. That there is a yet future reference to a rest. And because it's yet future, there are certain things that are required of us. It's a a requirement of labor. And you notice in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11, he says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest if any man fall after the same example of unbelief. A lack of faith is equated with a failure to labor in this passage. And we want to have that rest, and therefore we labor. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, 
I guess you could say this is before the Hebrews writer is really going to lay it on thick. He points out words of comfort that God acknowledges the good you've already done, but there's more to be done. But he says in verse 10 of Hebrews 6, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which he showed toward his name, in that you ministered to the saints and do minister. Sometimes people will try to reduce terms of labor to be something else. Well, it's just the faith or just the warm fuzzy in your heart or something else. But this specifically tells us at least one of the works involved. And it's that ministry that's described there in Hebrews chapter 6. But I think it's important to understand what faith is and how it requires labor to look at James chapter 2. Where James is writing to members of the church. He's not writing to people in denominations in the United States of America following the year 2000. He's writing to members of the church in the first century. However, much of what he says could apply to any of those situations, but he says in James chapter 2 and verse 14, asking the question, What doth the prophet, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Somebody shows up and says, Well, I have faith. I've got strong faith. I've got a lot of faith. I have a little faith. <laughs> what, what prophet is that saying that? You cover it up in your Bible and try to think up what the answer to that is. And then uncover it and say, are you right about that? James doesn't stop there. He answers the question. And as you look at it, he says, can faith save him? Verse 15, if a brother and sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. If you have faith, but there's no labor attached to that faith, it is a dead faith. By the way, saying be ye warmed and filled, that's an action, but it's not enough. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've got to do the things that God said for it to be real faith. Otherwise, it's not faith at all. And so there was a requirement of labor involved in this. There was a requirement of faith also. We've talked a lot about faith, but just narrowing it down to exactly what's said. He's going to have to go into a place that God is going to show him. He doesn't know where he's going at this point. And so there's that element of unknown involved in this. Now, faith is not always involved in the unknown. That's what trusting God is. But in this, he really has to lean on this trust of God. But he's actually going to have to sacrifice the son of promise. Now, I don't really understand exactly how much Abraham knew about the total scheme of redemption. But I think it's pretty clear that he understood that his own future hope depended somehow on this boy. I don't know how deep that went, but I think he understood at least some of that. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 20, we read this about faith. Now, somebody might get excited about James and say, you just didn't read far enough. There's a lot more about Abraham. I know we're going to get to that. But before we talk more about works in Abraham, I want to talk about faith in Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17, where it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, you see the promises are involved in this, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting, now watch it, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Do you follow what has happened here? The Hebrews writer, by inspiration, has given us insight into exactly what was going on in the brain of Abraham while all of this is taking place. Abraham is thinking, I'm going to go up, I'm going to sacrifice the boy, he's going to be a burnt offering, God's going to take those ashes and reassemble them, and I'm going to have my son. He didn't doubt that God would keep the first promise, regardless of what the command that came after was. He, had, he didn't have any doubts about that. That's what real faith is. Sometimes people get upset and all in a tizzy about things. I just think about, look, the Bible tells us that the church is going to be okay in the end. If you stay faithful, God's going to take care of it all. Your enemies can mock you. Your enemies can kill you. And it's going to be okay. You ever have a movie franchise that's out or a book perhaps? And the second or the third one is already out. 
You're reading the first one, you get halfway in, and your favorite character is facing certain death. And then you remember that you saw that face of that character on the cover of the next book. Whew. That's the way Abraham was thinking about these things. God is faithful. God had revealed to him that this son of promise was going to carry on. And so when Abraham is called on to sacrifice him, he knew that the end was going to be okay. Abraham was wrong about how it is he thought it was going to work out. But he was absolutely right that God could take care of these things. God can figure it out. What are you worried about? Worry is a difficult thing. It's a difficult challenge. When we look at all of life this way, it'll help us to alleviate worry in our own lives. So when it is that God tells us that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. Even in this life, the basic necessities, if I look at the end game and say, God promised it, whatever comes up is going to be okay. I can deal with it. It's going to be okay. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, going up a little bit in the book of Hebrews, again, we have Abraham's previous successes recorded. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. That's how he did it, by faith. He obeyed. I don't know if the Bible could be any clearer of what it means to have faith. And when Paul talks about the faith of Abraham being the saving faith, it's very clear what kind of faith that was. That's the quality of faith. Even when it's tried under the most extreme circumstances, he had that faith. You find the reference here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, back to chapter 12 of the book of Genesis that we talked about. But he says, to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. That's confidence that he had in God. And likewise, as you see the events taking place in Genesis chapter 22, the response of Abraham to these things. The first thing is that Abraham gave his time. He came up early in the morning. Chapter 22 and verse 3. Did you catch how he rose up early in the morning? Sometimes I dislike Michael because he gets up early in the morning. I don't know how that works. I still love him, but sometimes I dislike him. I'm not able to do that all the time. I don't have the ability to sleep past 730 very well but I can't get up before 4.30. I don't know what time Abraham rose up, but he got up early that day. It wasn't the only time that Abraham got up early either. Sending out Hagar in Genesis chapter 19, verse 20, uh, in uh, chapter 21 and verse 14, he got up early that day. Upon hearing about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he got up early that day. On big events, Abraham gets up early. It's going to take his time. You notice in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 4 that on the third day of the journey, they saw the mountain. But the text just doesn't tell us that they saw the mountain. They saw the mountain afar off on the third day. So three days. Now, how many people can afford to take three days off work? It's complicated. You think about a, a big organization, a, a big corporation just shutting down operations for three days. It required his time. Serving God does, in fact, require our time. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16 teaches this lesson, this concept, that we're supposed to be redeeming the time because the days are evil. Time is involved in that. Buy it back to whatever degree you can. Are you working towards those things? The practice of faith requires our time even when it comes to the assemblies of the saints. Well, that's a small part of it. We should spend time in prayer. We should spend time studying our Bibles. We should spend time helping others, doing the work of the church. All of those things require our time. Secondly, the response of Abraham is that he gave of his means. Now, Abraham was a rich man. But nobody likes throwing things away, right? Abraham was a rich man, and that reminds me of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18, how it is that Paul, writing to Timothy, talks about his responsibility to warn the rich and how it is that they need to be rich in good works and ready to distribute. This is the kind of man Abraham was, wasn't it? He gave of his means. He took servants with him. You know, they're on the clock. What's that worth? How do you calculate the value of those things? They had to get wood and take it with him. 
And so you think about all of the time and energy and resources that this took from Abraham, and there is a lesson there that faith, if it's not giving something, then it's giving nothing. What does it mean to have faith? Abraham understood these things. Most importantly, right there along with faith in a general sense, Abraham gave his trust. Genesis chapter 22, verses 5 and 6, Abraham said unto his young men, the servants, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, come again to you. We're going to go up, we're going to come back. Abraham had trust. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Some people like to speculate about how old Isaac was at this point. I've seen estimates that he was in his upper 30s, and some people say he was just an infant. He was old enough to carry the wood. He's a sturdy kid. When they get up on the mountain, how, do you, how is it, do you suppose, that he got Isaac to lay down when he raised the knife over him? There's a compliance involved in this, isn't there, in this command. Whether or not Isaac understood the Lord, he did what his father asked him to do. Abraham, being 100 years old, decided, today I'm going to go mountain climbing. Do you understand the faith that that requires? I don't want to go mountain climbing right now. Michael took me down to the fort over by the air base earlier. And there were some steep walkways. I was nervous. I don't like walking down those steep walkways. My grandfather is in his 90s, pretty strong, clear mind, great to have a conversation with. If he got up and he told my mom that he's going to go mountain climbing, she would have a conniption fit. And this is what Abraham did, 100 years old. He's going to climb up a mountain. This is what God required of him, and so he didn't flinch about doing it. That's what faith is. You understand that what God wants you to do is important, and you overlook all of the obstacles. You overlook, you look past, you look beyond all of the reasons why you shouldn't do it. And you try to find reasons you should. And you try to think about reasons why it's going to be a blessing to you and to others, having done it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth for their failure to fulfill what they had already said they were going to give. And he upholds the brethren in Macedonia as an example on their giving. They gave beyond what they were able to give. But the most important thing is in chapter 8 and verse 5 there, when he says, this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves. Abraham was willing to sacrifice everything in order to do what God said to do. If you tell me that climbing a mountain at 100 years old isn't life-threatening, I'm going to laugh at you. Potentially, it was, he rode the donkey too, right? Or at least had them with him. Just being around those are life-threatening sometimes. So there were a lot of risks involved in this, but the factor that counts is that Abraham had an unwavering faith and trust in God that it was all going to work out. And so he continued on in pursuit, walking by faith, not looking by sight at all the things that could go wrong, but by faith that what God said is right and for everybody's good. Abraham had real faith. He trusted in God's plans over the physical limits. Now, he was only told at first that he was supposed to go into the region of Moriah. And when he got there, God would designate which mountain it was. I've made references to that. And I think I was thinking about this earlier today when somebody posted up on social media the question of how is it that a person knows the will of God? Use your imagination and come up with what you might think the answers are. And I'm going to tell you that they were worse. Hardly anybody said anything about reading the Bible. But when I was thinking about that, I thought about John chapter 7 and verse 17, which says, if any man will to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. A lot of people read the Bible and they walk away completely confused because they have no intent on doing what God said to do. Would Abraham have found out the specific mountain if he hadn't got up and gotten into the region like God said in the first place? You think about an attitude of faith that's involved in this. People want to know more, but they're going to look at it and they say, well, I'm not going to obey the gospel until I have it all figured out. Until I can see what this is, where this is going to take me. I have to know first. Okay, 
I can tell you for sure what's going to happen to you if you don't. That's enough knowledge, isn't it? But a lot of people aren't going to be able to understand God because they just don't want to do what he says to do. And that's a lack of faith on some level. Abraham gave his son. The text refers to him as an only begotten son. But didn't God give his son? Do you understand what it meant to sacrifice Isaac? Do you understand what it meant for God to give his only begotten son? In John chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world in this way, this is a demonstration of how it is that God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Abraham understands what that passage means. We really don't. Not in the sense Abraham does. We can understand how it relates to us that God gave his son. I made a reference yesterday to Romans chapter 5. And how it is that you can imagine a good person. You, you might shove somebody out of the way of an oncoming truck if they're a really good person. But you're going to give your own life for a wretch? But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You're familiar with this story in Genesis chapter 22 and the beauty of the whole thing put together. And how it is that Isaac had asked Abraham, you know, I see the wood, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham told him, full of faith, once again, that God is going to provide the sacrifice. We read the passages that talk about that. God did provide the sacrifice. He found a ram in a thicket later, but that wasn't the fulfillment of what he said there. That wasn't the fulfillment of it. The fulfillment of it is found in John chapter 1 and verse 29 when John says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's the Lamb who is the real sacrifice. And He died for my sins. He died for your sins. And you're not going to get a benefit of that death if you're not willing by faith to do what God said to do. And God sent His Son so that you could have the benefit. But if you want to benefit from it, you're going to have to do what God said to do. You've heard what we said about faith. In James chapter 2, we read about it. Of, in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac his son by the altar? You think you can be justified without doing what God said to do. That blood is not going to benefit you one bit. The fact that Christ died for sins. Because faith without works is dead. It's nothing. It's vain. But the most important thing about this is the reward of Abraham. Through Isaac, his seed line would continue. Jesus would be born. And that would be the lamb which would take away the sin of the world. But ultimately, Abraham was called the friend of God. That's what the text tells us in James chapter 2 and verse 23. Abraham was the friend of God. I don't remember who said it. It was a good comment. People asked the question, it was somebody here yesterday, people asked the question, do you know God? But the real question is, does God know you? More importantly, does God count you as a friend? Does he look down at you and say, I know Jeff, he's going to stay faithful. I can trust him with difficult times. He's going to be faithful. And if that's the kind of person I am, and I choose to obey God, at the end of it all, after all this labor, I'll hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. Are you a child of God tonight? Are you getting any benefit from the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who was sinless, who died for us when we were in sin? Are you getting any benefit from that? What are you going to do about it if you're not? Listen to the word of God. That's how you have faith created. Romans 10 and verse 17. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 3 and verse 16. Repent of your sins. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Confess your faith in Christ. Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. And then you can be baptized, immersed in water. Have your sins washed away. And then you'll be a child of inheritance. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. If you're a child of God and you've wandered away, you've lacked faith and you need to make that right tonight. You need to repent of your sins that have separated you from God so that one day you will hear those wonderful words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. Won't you do it as together we stand and sing?